Ordinary ethers, which have the structure ROR, are generally not good electrophiles for nucleophilic substitution reactions. Using an ether in a nucleophilic substitution reaction would involve something along the lines of kicking off an alkoxide leaving group, either via an SN2 or an SN1 type mechanism. And the problem with doing this is that alkoxide is not a good leaving group, despite the electronegativity of the oxygen atom. To prove this, we only need to think about pKa values. Keep in mind our criterion for what makes a good leaving group, a pKa of the conjugate acid of the leaving group less than zero. What's the pKa of the conjugate acid of an alkoxide? That is, an alcohol? In fact, it's way above zero. It's up on the order of 15. And so alkoxide and the analogous hydroxide are poor leaving groups. Only in situations when we can somehow counter the instability of OR- can ethers participate in nucleophilic substitutions. And there's really only one ether structure that can participate in nucleophilic substitutions for reasons that we actually understand from previous discussions of cycloalkanes. That's the epoxide structure. An epoxide consists of a three-membered ring in which two of the atoms are sp3 hybridized carbons and the third is an oxygen. In that respect, it's an ether. It's an oxygen connecting two carbon groups. But it's an extremely unique ether because it's highly strained due to the three-membered ring. Epoxides can participate in nucleophilic substitution reactions. Not because there's anything special about their oxygens per se, but because after nucleophilic substitution, the three-membered ring is opened, forming an unstrained acyclic intermediate. This is often favorable in spite of the generation of O- due to the alleviation of ring strain upon this opening. In the remainder of this video, we'll look at the mechanisms of nucleophilic substitutions of epoxides, which are somewhat unique in acidic and basic solutions with weak and strong nucleophiles respectively, epoxides behave a little bit differently. Just to drive this point home once more, opening of an epoxide through some kind of nucleophilic substitution process, be it SN1-like or SN2-like, leads to the alleviation of ring strain. While our focus here has been on nucleophilic substitutions and steps like the SN2 and D sub N steps occurring in the SN2 and SN1 reactions respectively, other steps that involve the cleavage of a sigma bond, such as bimolecular elim elimination, also occur for epoxides. These may involve, for example, an internal nucleophile existing at one of these R groups, kicking off or breaking the CO bond. Upon protonation of the epoxide oxygen, which actually may occur before nucleophilic attack under acidic conditions, we end up with a product that contains a nucleophilic group and a hydroxyl group in a 1-2 relationship, or a beta-substituted alcohol. The example shown here is a perfectly symmetric substrate, but in general, epoxides will have different substituents linked to their two carbons. And this introduces an issue of what's called site selectivity. Epoxides consist of two electrophilic carbons, both carbons linked to the oxygen, since cleavage of either one of these bonds would lead to the alleviation of ring strain. A nucleophile that approaches an epoxide has a choice to make. Does the nucleophile attack the less substituted position, placing the hydroxyl group ultimately on the more substituted position? Or does the nucleophile attack the more substituted position, leaving the hydroxyl group linked to the less substituted position? We'll see shortly how the outcome of nucleophilic substitution of an epoxide depends on the reaction conditions used. For the time being, let's draw the two possibilities. If the nucleophile attacks the less substituted position, the hydroxyl group ends up linked to the carbon bearing more substituents, in this case, the carbon bearing the R group. Notice that stereochemically, because the carbon R bond has not been broken or really involved in the mechanism at all in this red case, it's still going to exist on a wedge in the final product. In the alternative pathway, involving nucleophilic attack at the more substituted position, an inversion of configuration occurs at the site of nucleophilic attack, and the hydroxyl group ends up linked to the less substituted position, here the position bearing two hydrogens. The general idea, the details of which we'll explore in the remainder of this video, is that under acidic conditions, the blue pathway is favored with coordination of the nucleophile to the more substituted carbon, while under basic conditions, the red pathway is favored with the nucleophile coordinating to the less substituted position. When an epoxide or really any electrophilic molecule is placed in acidic solution, a weak 
nucleophile will be involved in the reaction as strong nucleophiles cannot exist under acidic conditions. For example, in the reaction scheme shown here, sulfuric acid is used to create acidic conditions and the solvent, which also serves as the nucleophile, is methanol. Under these conditions, epoxides react selectively at their more substituted carbons. That is, the more substituted carbon is the one that ends up with a bond to the nucleophile. For example, in the substrate shown here, the epoxide contains two distinct carbons with different substitution patterns. This carbon bears two methyl groups, while this carbon bears two hydrogens. The major product, indeed the only product observed, is the one in which the nucleophile has formed a bond to the more substituted carbon, the one bearing two methyl groups, in preference to the less substituted carbon. How can we explain this selectivity for substitution at the more substituted position? Well, something in the mechanism should allow us to explain this, so let's now take a look at the mechanism for this process. Sulfuric acid is a strong acid, and unsurprisingly, in the first step of the mechanism, it protonates the most basic position in the epoxide, namely the oxygen. This step leads to the aptly named protonated epoxide intermediate, and thinking deeply about the nature of the protonated epoxide is the key to understanding selectivity for substitution under acidic conditions. In an asymmetrically substituted substrate like this, with two methyl groups on one side and two hydrogens on the other, the two carbons of the protonated epoxide are inequivalent. For example, the bond lengths, the CO bond lengths, are different for these two carbons. These bond lengths and the extents of partial charges on the two carbons actually follow intuitive ideas about inductive effects and carbocation stability that we've seen before. The more substituted carbon bears a greater partial positive charge than the less substituted carbon. Due to the electron donating nature of these CH3 groups, they're inductively donating. The difference in bond lengths reflects this idea as well, and we can see that in this structure on the right in which the carbon-oxygen bond to the more substituted carbon, the one bearing two methyl groups, is considerably longer than the bond to the carbon bearing two hydrogens. This is again because this more substituted carbon is better able to support positive charge than the less substituted carbon. And this creates a key preference for the nucleophile to attack at the more substituted position, since it's the position with greater partial positive charge. In the next step, through an SN2 process, the nucleophile attacks the electrophilic carbon and displaces the carbon-oxygen bond in an SN2 elementary step. So notice, for example, that backside attack occurs here with the two CH3 groups flipping into an upward pointing position in a kind of umbrella flip type of process like we've seen for SN2 previously. And the carbon oxygen bond or carbon nucleophile bond more generally is on the opposite side of these two groups than the carbon oxygen bond was in the original epoxide. Both of these features are hallmarks of the SN2 elementary step. A final proton transfer, usually to a molecule of the nucleophile, which here is also used as the solvent, gives the neutral product, which contains the nucleophile bound to the more substituted carbon and the hydroxyl group still connected to the less substituted carbon. Keep in mind the overall process of proton transfer in the first step, generating the key protonated epoxide intermediate. Keep in mind this difference between more and less substituted carbons in terms of partial charge in the protonated epoxide, and you'll have no trouble deducing that the nucleophile will attack the more substituted position preferentially under these conditions. In a basic solution, such as that created when an anionic nucleophile or salt of an anionic nucleophile is mixed with a solvent, epoxides react selectively at their less substituted carbons. In other words, the nucleophile forms a bond preferentially to the less substituted carbon. Here we're using the same substrate as before with a more substituted carbon bearing two methyl groups and a less substituted carbon bearing two hydrogens. In the final product, the nucleophile, OCH3-, has bonded selectively with the less substituted carbon. This is the opposite sense of selectivity as the acidic case. Because we're under basic conditions now, no protonation of the epoxide occurs, and so the mechanism of this substitution is fundamentally different. In fact, the mechanism still involves SN2 substitution, but because the nucleophile used is strong and there's no acid around to protonate the epoxide, SN2 substitution can occur immediately as the first step of the mechanism. This step opens the ring directly and in fact sets the site selectivity since the nucleophile is forming a bond 
to one of the carbons of the epoxide. Proton transfer in the next step generates the neutral final product, in which the nucleophile has formed a bond to the less substituted position and the hydroxyl group remains connected to the more substituted position. Notice here again in this SN2 step that an inversion of configuration occurs with these hydrogens kind of umbrella flipping into an upward pointing position and that the bond to the nucleophile, the carbon-oxygen bond here, is on the opposite side of these two hydrogens from the carbon-oxygen bond in the original epoxide. Key stereochemical evidence that an SN2 step is occurring. We still haven't directly addressed this question of why the nucleophile prefers to engage in SN2 at the less substituted position. Ultimately, it comes down to something we already know about the SN2 reaction, that it is more rapid at less sterically hindered carbons. And so the result that strong nucleophiles that engage in direct SN2 with epoxides react at their less substituted positions should be intuitive from our previous understanding of how the SN2 reaction works. It's all about steric hindrance. There's much more hindrance at the more substituted position, and so substitution does not occur here. It occurs preferentially at the less substituted, less hindered carbon.